Uh, I have it as 705. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. I, I pledge okay. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First item on the agenda is the review and approval of the minutes. But if the board will indulge me, I'd like to push that off towards the end and we can we can start by taking people right off. Okay. Some of them sure. for us. If that's okay. Okay, I'm getting nods of assent. Yes. First item of business is application of 11 Chapel Street, LLC for property at 11 Chapel Street, map U2, lot three, zone M2, for a variance to allow proposed conversion of a 620 square foot of an accessory barn structure for commercial retail use pursuant to section 32-5, section one, and three permit the expansion of non-conforming use and structure on a lot that does not meet current dimensional and use requirements and a variance to section 32-46, section six, to allow parking within the front yard. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the uh, uh, applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. My name is Chris Mulligan. I'm an attorney with Bozen and Associates in Portsmouth. And I'm the uh, attorney for the applicant, 11 Chapel Street, LLC. Um, with me on the call tonight is uh, Caper Connell, the um, principal of 11 Chapel Street, LLC. Uh, Eric Weinrib of Altus Engineering, who prepared the site plan that you have in your <coughs> And also uh, Chris Sigmont, who is our proposed tenant for the bike shop that we are proposing to locate um, in the space should the variances be granted. Um, just a bit of background, Mr. Connell acquired this property in 2017. Um, if you're familiar with the property, it was in a fair amount of distress and he's um, done quite a lot of work to bring the property up to uh, snuff, so to speak. The, uh, the property itself um, consists of two single family dwellings and what had been a very dilapidated um, and substandard uh, accessory barn structure that has since been raised and um, actually moved 20 feet at the suggestion of the building inspector um, and placed in its current location. Um, what we um, are here before you tonight for is um, to seek permission to site an independent um, uh, retail use on the first floor of that um, newly created structure that replaced the existing barn. Um, the property itself, um, in its existing condition is non-conforming um, in a number of respects, including as to lot area for dwelling, residential density, and both the front and side yard setbacks. Um, it's also a, somewhat of a unique property in a couple of other respects. Um, it has a Chapel Street address, um, although the only access is uh, from Granite Street, it's a corner lot. Um, the um, topography of the uh, lot is such that you really can't access the lot in any meaningful way from Granite Street, even though that's the street address. The main structure on the property fronts Granite Street and has a porch that overlooks Granite Street, but you actually access it, um, uh, excuse me, Chapel Street, but you actually access it from Granite Street. Um, the other thing that is um, somewhat unique about this, and it's part of the relief we've requested, along Granite Street in front of the um, three bedroom residence that abuts Granite Street. Um, there have historically been um, stacked parking, three cars in a row right before the um, stop sign um, as you um, get to the corner of Granite and Chapel Street. 
Um, we're seeking relief to formalize that parking arrangement. Um, that's relief under section 32-46. Um, but um, I think it's important to note that we're not requesting any substantive change to what already exists on the ground. This is a parking configuration that um, to my knowledge has existed for many, many years. Um, so there's really no change there. Part of the site improvements that we're proposing um, would be to square off the driveway um, into the property from Granite Street, which would um, uh, significantly improve the functionality of that driveway um, and eliminate um, potential conflicts between um, uh, vehicles entering and exiting the pro property and the existing parking that's stacked along the side of Granite Street. Um, so um, with that said, um, the proposal is to um, convert the first, um, first story of the accessory dwelling into, uh, which is approximately 620 square feet, uh, into a um, retail facility. The specifics is that it would be a bike shop. We have Mr. Zygma here who is going to be the proprietor of the bike shop should this be approved and answer questions regarding the operation. Um, but the property itself is um, on a lot that's uh, just over 8,500 square feet. Um, it's in the M2 zone, which is a uh, contemplates a mix of residential and commercial uses. We feel that this is a use that would be complementary to the neighboring and surrounding uses. Um, as I've noted in the materials that I've, the immediate abutter on Granite Street is the Stone School, um, which is entirely a non-residential use. Um, further down from that one door over is the Stone Church, again, an entirely um, uh, non-residential use. And I think significantly, um, both of those um, uses um, are what I would consider to be somewhat uh, complementary in terms of the uh, likelihood of conflict with um, a business such as this, which would primarily be operating during the daytime. Um, uh, it, at least the Stone Church seems to be a uh, uh, operation that um, primarily uh, sees um, visitors and traffic in the evening hours. Um, and the Stone School um, historically has uh, very limited actual operations, um, uh, you know, sort of a de minimis impact on the neighborhood. So we don't feel like this would um, uh, promote or produce any type of overcrowding or conflict with um, what exists in the neighborhood today. Um, so with that, by way of introduction, I would just like to go against criteria that you need to find in order to grant the variances that we're requesting. Um, and specifically, um, granting the requested variances will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the ordinance, nor will it be contrary to the public interest. These are two of the criteria you have to find. Um, and under case law in New Hampshire, these are considered together. And um, what you need to consider here is whether or not granting the variances would result in a change to the essential characteristics of the neighborhood or um, whether there would be any negative impact on the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, here, we don't feel that either of um, those would occur with what we're proposing. The character of the neighborhood would not be altered in any significant way. Again, um, there's a mix of residential and non-residential uses in the neighborhood as it stands. And the, um, uh, the use we feel is complementary to existing uses that already exist in the neighborhood. Um, the uh, M1 zone of which this is a part is a uh, zone that um, according to your ordinance um, is to provide for relatively high density and a mix of uses. And we feel that this accomplishes uh, that intent. Um, 
Excuse me. Granny. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify, it's not the M1 zoning district, it's the M2 zoning district. I, I apologize, Diane, you you are correct. That was a typo. I, respect, I didn't mean to interrupt, I just, the, the, the requirements are considerably different. Okay, thank you, sorry. No, no, you are correct, thank you. Um, so um, the, uh, the next criteria you need to focus on is whether um, substantial justice would be done by granting the variance. Um, whether or not substantial justice is done requires the board to balance um, the uh, hardship on the applicant should you require strict compliance with the ordinance against any gain to the public. Um, in this case, we don't feel there's any benefit to the public in denying the variances that's not outweighed by the hardship on the owner. Um, the existing exterior of the buildings will not change um, in any uh, significant manner. And um, the site provides sufficient parking to accommodate the proposed commercial use. Um, to the extent um, we need waivers of parking requirements, those are things we have to go before the planning board to request. Um, and the planning um, is another level or layer of protection that um, the town and the public has to protect the public interest. Um, so we think substantial justice would be done by granting the variances we've requested. The next um, item for your consideration is whether values of surrounding properties will be diminished by granting the variances. Um, here we don't feel the variances will negatively affect um, surrounding properties in any way. With respect to the requested parking variance, um, this is already an existing parking condition um, with the parking along the uh, Granite Street um, elevation of the property um, that has existed historically for many years and um, nothing is uh, substantially changing there. Um, with respect to the commercial use, um, again, there are a, um, a number of non-residential uses in the immediate vicinity and the M2 zone provides for um, commercial, mixed commercial um, uses. So we feel that it's um, appropriate. Again, the exterior of the um, buildings will not be altered in any way with the exception of um, signage, which would have to go through uh, proper permitting process. Another level and layer of review that will protect the public. Um, so um, approval from the planning board is also going to be required further protecting the public. So values of surrounding properties uh, will not be diminished. Um, then finally, um, in order to grant a variance, you have to find that um, there are special conditions associated with the property um, that present an unnecessary hardship um, such that strict compliance with uh, the zoning ordinance um, prevents the proper enjoyment of the property. Um, as I've discussed, this is a property that was in um, significant need of substantial upgrades. Um, Mr. Connell has uh, spent a fair and substantial amount of uh, money renovating and rehabbing the uh, buildings on the property, um, including uh, removing the dilapidated and frankly dangerous barn structure that had existed and replacing it with um, the two-story structure that uh, is currently there and what we're seeking relief to site the bicycle shop in tonight. Um, there, uh, it's a corner lot that has a number of pre-existing non-conformities, including the pre-existing parking arrangement out on Granite Street. Um, the, uh, the fact that it is as to lot density um, for dwelling and as to side and front yard setbacks. And the fact that it's a property that has a Chapel Street address, but is in fact, um, in, in fact, accessed uh, exclusively through Granite Street, which is a much less intensely used um, right of way um, than, um, than Chapel Street. Um, so those are all special conditions that uh, distinguish it from other uh, properties in the neighborhood such that um, we believe there is uh, uh, no fair and substantial relationship between the purpose of the um, 
provisions of the ordinance in their application of this particular property. Um, commercial uses are contemplated within this zone. This is a very modest commercial use. It's just over 600 square feet. Um, the parking requirement should be very minimal um, and we can seek waivers if we need them from the planning board. Um, and the, um, uh, the use is a reasonable use. It's uh, consistent with uses within the zone. Um, as I've stated on a number of occasions, the immediate abutting uh, uses are not uh, residential uses in their entirety. Um, the lot is got a, a significant uh, topography element to it. It's slopes downhill um, as you head towards Main Street in a, a very significant manner. Um, so the, the siting of the buildings on the lot is appropriate for um, the, the conditions on the lot. Um, and the, the use is a reasonable use because it's, it's otherwise permitted in this zone um, uh, because the M2 zone um, contemplates a mix of residential and commercial uses. Um, so with that, um, we've submitted plans. You have um, a, a, a proposed site plan, um, which identifies the structure with cross thatch, um, uh, cross thatching, which is where the um, uh, proposed bike shop would be sited. Um, and we've also got floor plans, which show the um, open garage bay and front door um, and uh, give you the dimensions of the, uh, the space that would be used for this use. Um, so if you have any questions, I think that's, um, that's it for my presentation. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for, for taking the time to meet and um, we all have our lives and, you know, it's everything's a challenge these days. So I want to thank every one of you individually. Um, I'm, yeah, I have, have owned the property since 2017. Um, and I bought it and it was heavily distressed. Um, I just remember the first time I went through it with Nancy Kingston, there were deer drying in the barn, uh, you know, deer pelts and um, or deer hides. And there was um, all kinds of stuff. And uh, the the yellow house, the, which I call the farmhouse, um, it was just, it, there wasn't a door inside. It was, uh, you know, it just kind of, I would say for, it, it's almost like squat, you know? Um, and I took a lot of pride in, in what I've done. Um, and I've got great tenants. Everybody's very happy. I've had, um, since 2017, I've had three turnovers on the yellow house and no turnover on the blue house. Um, just great people. Everybody seems to be positive in the neighborhood. Um, and I've had a good, good rapport with everybody um, at the um, Stone Church, including um, Mr. Hoffman, who's been resource um also very positive um so yeah i'm just um trying to give you a little story i i um want to make the town better I, I love new market i've grown up here um grew up in portsmouth and rye um both my parents were entrepreneurs um my father was in the restaurant business and my mother was a professional photographer um bit of a socialite but um, that's how I know Brad, Brad Lown there. But yeah, that's all. Um, nothing, nothing to add other than who I am. Maybe you um, don't know who I am, but hopefully now you do. So. Well, with the presentations from the uh, owner being made, I'll open this up to public comment. If there's anyone out there that has um, something to say uh, about this proposal. Uh, now is your time to, uh, to speak. If you do choose to speak, just state your name and address for the record, please.
It's one of the reasons I hate Zoom meetings. I can't tell who wants to say what where. Hi, my name is Karen Gorski, and I just bought 19 Spring Street, and my garage will be across the street from this proposed location. Okay. Um, my question would be in, regarding parking, uh, since my two car garage is on Granite Street, if there was not parking, what would the feasibility be if there was no parking that somebody would park in my space to get to this bike shop? Did you understand what she was saying that the question to everybody here? Yes. 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 Do you, do you have a response to that or? Uh, um, Mr. Chair, I guess I, I guess I would respond uh, again, Chris Mulligan for the applicant. Um, it, it's clearly not our intent to um, to use um, parking from the, that belongs to 19 Spring Street for the, the benefit of um, this project. Um, what vision is that there, and, and you can see this on the plans, um, there are a number of um, parking spaces on the site that we've uh, engineered. And um, I've got Eric Weinrib here who can discuss those if that's necessary. Um, but we also, um, believe that there's an opportunity if it's necessary and we don't know that it is at this point um if if there is conflict um we think that um we might be able to work something out uh for overflow parking with um, either the stone school or the stone church or both if it gets to that I, i'm not um you know personally i don't believe that we're going to um be witnessing uh a situation where we're in a parking crunch because the size of what we're proposing is relatively modest, um, just over 600 square feet. Um, it's not going to accommodate, um, you know, a, a, an influx, uh, a massive influx of, of patrons at any given time. Um, but it also, I, you know, I would point out that I, I think to some extent the um, the area is pedestrian friendly. I mean, you can access Granite Street through the um, the stairs to the Stone Church um, from Church Street, and uh, you know people can walk from Main Street. Um, again, we think that this is a relatively benign and complementary use for this neighborhood. So we don't anticipate there being um, any conflict. We certainly don't intend to be using 19 Spring Street, um, you know, for our own personal use, of course. Uh, but we don't we don't foresee any conflict there. If, if I can add, uh, this Eric Weinrib with Altus Engineering, I uh, prepared the site plan, and I, I would just like to add that the business use um, complements the two residential uses, and most likely when people are at the business, it's when the residents are not home. So that provides more parking on um, spaces than, you know, for the business use. But like Chris said, likelihood is that um, we will not, you know, use all of those spaces. Additionally, I just don't foresee many people, just general nature of people, I think, are, are not going to pull up to us a property, realize there's not parking and park on someone else's property and someone else's driveway. I, I just don't see that happening. They're going to go another place to park and, and walk there or come back at a different time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Does anyone else have any input on this uh, uh, proposal? I might just add something quick, uh, Christopher Zygmunt, the proposed tenant. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, because it is a, a small boutique bicycle shop, 
one thing we need just to consider for traffic is a reasonable number of those people that would be coming would be coming by bicycle, not by car. Uh, and they take up a lot less space. So we'll have a bike rack for them to park their bike in. And uh, we, we hope and expect to see a lot of the people that would visit us visit us by bike. Is there any more comment from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment section and open it up to discussion amongst the members. <clears throat> I guess the, uh, I guess I'll start. The big concern I've got how um, this proposal has got us buying into the fact that we're giving him three parking spaces on Granite Street. I realize it's been that way for a while, but it's town property. And I don't think this board has the authority uh, to grant that. That's something that they should be taking up with the town council. Um, you know, I, I know they've been parking there for years, but if, you know, if, if we let that happen, then every other parcel in town, they can claim their frontage as open parking counted as part of the density of the uh, allowable parking. And I don't think that's a precedent we want to set. Wayne, go for it. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. OK. Well, my concern was exactly the same, Bob. Um, I didn't know exactly how that would work either. How, how many parking spaces are required in this, Diane? You're muted, Diane. Diane? You're muted. OK. Um, we have two residential units that are there currently. And residential units as a base require two spots per unit. So there's four there. Um, the, we have a standard for business parking per retail of one parking space per 250 square feet. And I worked the figures with the applicant uh, a while ago. <coughs> My memory's a little foggy on it and I haven't visited the site plan. But um, the park, there's enough room, I think, probably for three parking spaces on site. Um, He's got five yeah. on site. In, in addition to what's there for the residential. Uh, no, they're on site. He's got five parking spaces. Okay, so he needs four for the residential and he needs one space per 200 square feet. However, this is the M2 zone and the M2 zone Parking is handled differently than in, say, the business zone, where there's a prescribed standard. And there is flexibility that's pro provided for shared parking. There's also flexibility for parking on off site, i.e., if it's on site, you get so many points, so forth. So these are things that the planning board, as part of their review of the parking plan, will uh, discuss. And if necessary, as Mr. Weinberg, um, when Rob indicated, um, there could be some variant, not variances, but exceptions granted by the planning board, provided it meets certain conditions. That's in their purview. Um, so did I answer your question? 620. So I, I came up with nine spaces, including the three out in the street. Am I wrong? One, two, three. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. I got eight. Now, I think there's uh, the, the handicap is that two spaces or one? There's yeah. one parking space, but that has to be, you know, provided with an access aisle and that sort of thing. Okay. All right. So there's eight spaces. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Chair, can I make a suggestion? Um, because I, I think your concern is a very valid one. And, um, you know, when we were originally were looking at this application, it wasn't clear to me that it was appropriate for us to even for that variance relief because of precisely what you uh, honed in on. Um, the spaces that we're looking, um, that we're asking for a variance for are outside of the boundary of our property. Um, given what Ms. Hardy has explained that we um, uh, have uh, enough spaces for either the residential use or the proposed commercial use, um, not at the same time, but that we can seek some type of relief or waiver from the planning board. Um, uh, I would suggest that if, if, you're, if you're concerned about setting that type of precedent, um, it, it's a valid concern. Um, we would withdraw the parking variance request and just roll with the use request. I was hoping someone would say something like that. It's greatly appreciated. The complimentary parking spaces, I know exactly how that works in a residential, in this type of neighborhood. People go out to work during the day and the parking spaces are open for the businesses. So it's worked well in several instances. I've seen like in Exeter and some places in Portsmouth. So sure. I would have no problem with, with that, I, that concept. So we pass, basically we're passing it on to the plan slash town council to make that decision. Not the town council, the planning board. Okay. I mean, the, the town council would have to weigh in on granting use of public property like that. That's it's already been, Bob, it's been used for the last 30 years. Yeah, so, wink, so wink, there wink, might wink. be some prescriptive rights associated with that. And if I mean, the <coughs> town can regulate parking on any town street, I guess there's a question to of the width of the street? Is it a standard street? Is it a 50 foot right of way? So there's a lot of questions that come up in, in ass assessing that. But, um, and we have lots of areas where people park on the town road out in front of their property. It's, and it's, it's not something that we go to the town council and specifically ask approval for. It's, it's in the town's parking codes that it's restricted, that's one thing. And I don't believe that those parking spaces are restricted by the town's parking code. I, I Can I say something? Sure. Uh, I agree with everything you just said, but I still think that Bob's right, that we shouldn't set a precedent here by, by acting on it. And I'm glad he was okay. willing to withdraw that. Because I, I don't have any problem with anything else. I did have a problem with, with the street spaces, so. In this. I think that's a great um, solution to the problem, I think, as, as uh, the chairman has pointed out. And I'm not <coughs> a bad idea at all. I just think that there's some questions that need to be looked at and at the planning board level to establish, are those legitimate spaces? Does the town regulate them? Does the town own them? Is it Are they on town property? Are they they are. On, and we don't really to, know that. According then, to the boundary survey, they are on town property. Okay, but they've been using it for the last 30 years. The town can allow that. And the town has not restricted it. So I don't understand. I mean, we can clarify it with the town highway safety committee if you'd like to. I mean, we can do that. No, I mean, the, the M, M2 zone is clear that in item six is that on-site parking shall not be allowed between the front of the property uh, property primary structure in the street. Well, here there is no space between the primary structure and the street. It is the street. So <laughs> I got I, the, the solution Mr. Mulligan came up with works. If this, I'm I'm in favor of letting it proceed at this point with that with that caveat. But uh, I think it's a great use of the property. I, I commend Mr. Connell Connell for for a, a section of urban blight. And uh, I, I guess I'd like to move forward with it. I, I have one other thing. <laughs> Bob? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, and I wasn't going to bring this up, but uh, 
when I was there, I visited on Saturday, and this is in response to the abutters' concern about parking. And I don't, I agree with everything. I don't think anybody will be using her garage space parking for to, to, to abuse that. Um, well, when I was there on Saturday, I did notice there was a car parked. I was there about oh, maybe nine o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock. There was a car and there's no way that you could make it into the entrance there. And I, I would request that for your neighbor across the street to make it feel her feel better, that you police somehow, don't ask me how you're gonna police it, but that you don't block that entrance way with parking now. I had to represent a seller in Portsmouth in front of the planning board and it took us a whole year. It was so painful. Who? Please. I don't know who that was. <laughs> Penny, could you identify yourself, please? It was Penny. Yeah, it was. Well, Penny, could you identify yourself, please? Yes, I'm sorry, that was me by mistake. Okay, um, can, can you give us your name and address for the record? Absolutely, Penny Wood. Okay. 29 Raider, R-A-E-D-E-R -E -E Drive in Stratum, New Hampshire. Very good, thank you. You're welcome, sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> Oh, I guess if they could address that, I think their neighbors would feel better. That's all. I think that's that's a reasonable request. I, I don't foresee that being any problem for Mr. Connell. Other than that, I think it's a great use. I notice, um, I think you're being modest on the, uh, on the uh, renovations. I notice there's a new foundation under that barn. I mean, there's quite a bit of expense spent there and and i think everything is moving <laughs> forward at a good pace and i i don't have a problem with the whole concept well, any other members of the board want to speak up yeah i'd be i'd be glad to i i agree with with all all the points the spirit and the tenet of the ordinance sustainable justice the values of surrounding properties, hardship and reasonable use. I clicked them all off as I went through the, uh, through the view, um, not to be a joiner, but I also went up there uh, and parking was the first thing I saw, but it seems like it's so the, the uh, planning board's gonna take care of that for me. I don't have anything additional to add. Um, some of the points that have been brought up already. No, me neither, Bob. I, I'm going to support uh, granting the variance. I think uh, <clears throat> I think Attorney Mulligan put together a nice nice proposal, and um, I appreciate that. So so thank you. The um, and Wayne's right. The the applicant has uh, done a lot of good work up there. Uh, I'm happy to support it. I did have concerns uh, about the the parking as well but and and they were different than what's been discussed here but in light of the fact that uh, attorney mulligan has uh drawn that particular request they're moved anyway so i think uh, uh, i'm happy to support the uh the application and, uh, and vote in favor of granting the variance okay um i'm willing to accept a motion uh, so we can vote on this I, I'll take a stab at this, if nobody else will. Um, I'll make a motion that we grant the variance to sections 32-5, section one and three, that permit the expanded, expansion of a non-conforming use and structure on a lot that does not meet current dimensional 
and use requirements and that we use the findings herein as our findings of fact and that um, uh, as, a, as a special condition also that we ask that the property owner uh, see what he can do to minimize the impact on um, the parking on the abutting uh, property uh, property owners. Let's second the motion. Who was that? Al. Al. Al seconded the motion. All those in favor, we got to do a roll call vote. Wayne? Aye. Al? Aye. Steve? I vote aye. Jim? Aye. And I vote aye. You have, you have the variance. Thank you for putting... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you for putting together a good package. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> all right. The next next one is a um, an application for appeal of an administrative decision from Wayne Willett Willett Family Trust concerning clarification of a 2005 zoning board decision and administrative decision of Diane Hardy, the zoning administrator, dated January 27, 2001, regarding a 5,000 square foot vacant lot at 2123 Ham Street extension, U2 lot 310 in zone R2. Uh, is anyone here from the uh, Willett Trust, the Willett family? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, William Ouellette is with me here in the room, uh, and I'm going to speak for him if that's okay. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, my name is Brad Lown. I represent the Ouellette Kerfel Family Trust that owns this property. Um, uh, it took us 15 years, but we're back here for the purpose of clarifying the decision from December of 05. <coughs> Uh, you have in your packet the, the letter from Diane Hardy, which I, which I thank her for. It lays out the history of the property and uh, the procedural history of this case. Uh, back in December of 05, uh, the, this board, different members, but uh, this board made a finding that the, 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 this was a lot, they were two separate lots, the 2123 Ham Street extension lot is a duplex and the lot adjacent to it is about 5,100 square feet. It's, a, uh, it's an empty lot. And uh, we, uh, the, the, the ZBA uh, in 05 found that they were two record. Now that finding that there were two lots of record uh, necessarily means that the 5,100 square foot lot is uh, a non-conforming grandfather lot of record. Now I'm gonna just talk for a minute about those, what those terms are. I'm sure you've all heard them before, uh, but non-conforming simply means that it doesn't comply with the current lot size requirement under the current zoning ordinance. Grandfathered <laughs> means that it is uh, exempted from the uh, uh, certain uh, provisions of the ordinance and it comes with vested rights. Uh, that's what grandfathered means. If it's a lot of record, and it is, and the ZBA has already found that it existed prior to the enactment of the ordinance, so it's a lot of record, then it is grandfathered and there are vested rights that come with that. Uh, the, the reason why we're back here uh, tonight, Mr. Chairman, is to clarify the decision that was issued in 05. Now, uh, the, the minutes of the meeting were uh, a little bit sketchy, but the, the board found that there were two separate buildable lots of uh, two separate lots of record. Uh, but as Diane Hardy says, uh, the uh, issue of buildability was clearly stated uh, by, by me that it was clearly requested. It was not fully discussed is what she says in her letter. And the decision was inconclusive 
and should be clarified. So that's why we're back here is to clarify uh, that decision in December of 05. The, the buildable issue is this, that under New Hampshire law, a, uh, an existing uh, lot of record is buildable. And uh, the, the, the case is a 1976 New Hampshire Supreme Court case, Bat, Batcock, B-A-T-T-C-O-C-K versus Town of Rye, that stands for the proposition that a lot of record is buildable. And that what that does not mean is that you, uh, it doesn't mean that you automatically get a variance or that you can uh, uh, build something that is not in compliance with the ordinance. Uh, what it does mean is that a structure can be built on the lot, uh, and, uh, but as long as it is within the, uh, the uh, provisions of the existing ordinance, and that's, uh, that's why we're here. My client doesn't have any present intention of building on the lot. He may be interested in selling it, uh, but uh, uh, he wants to buy this decision from 05 uh, uh, so that the board can confirm that this is a, a buildable lot. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, this, uh, this lot is in a neighborhood where there are a number of non-conforming lots and structures. Uh, if the if the board uh, agrees that this is buildable and if ultimately there's a structure built on this lot, uh, it would be, uh, it's got town water and sewer. It's uh, what I would call an infill development uh, within, within walking distance of town. Uh, it's uh, something that could be relatively affordable as opposed to a structure that's uh, built on the uh, half acre minimum lot size. Uh, so we, we are here just for the purpose of clarifying that this is a buildable lot. Uh, that's, that's all we're looking for. I think under New Hampshire law, it is a buildable lot. I believe that's what the law is. That's what we're asking the, the board to find. Uh, that is the board already having found that it is a lot of record. And I think what necessarily follows from that is that it is non-conforming uh, and uh, that it is grandfathered with existing vested rights to build in accordance with the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with this presentation being made, if uh, I'd like to open it up real quick to the public, if there's anybody that wishes to speak on this right now, uh, now's your opportunity. Um, is there anyone out there that like to comment on this. Well, I don't see anybody beating the doors down. So with that, I'm going to close the public comment section and uh, we'll open up to discussion amongst the board members. Come on, guys, I know you got opinions. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I went through the chronologically through the through the notes and um, if I were and I am just reading it as, as an outsider not being involved in it, it was clear in the notification that the request was for uh, two buildable lots. It was it was stated so in the notice. My suspicions are that it was also stated in the about been in the abutters notices, because again that was the the statement regarding two lots and buildable lots. Um, the I, I was question I went through the notes of the uh, of the meeting as well, and I think Diane was concerned that from the notes it wasn't clearly explained or deliberated, I'm sorry, deliberated enough. And that's a, a concern that she expressed. Um, I thought um, after reading the notes and listening to Brad's uh, explanation about the issues involved, that it was pretty clearly explained. He talked uh, about the two buildable lot issue. He talked about the, what he mentioned a moment ago, moment ago and that was the Babcock versus the town of Rye. Um, 
so I didn't I didn't uh, come to the same conclusion that Diane did that it wasn't fully deliberated based on the notes. Um, and um, um, it, it, the other comment I would make is we all know that um, notes are just notes. They're not comprehensive discussions about um, about the actual um, discussions that went on. So it's hard to see from that notes, from those notes, other than the ones presented by the by Brad, that there wasn't full discussion. So I, I have a, a bit of a difficult time um, um, agreeing that um, from what I could see that it wasn't full deliberate. Well, That's my anyone else? I don't think what well, in, in, in my opinion, the fact that they went through this effort, person doesn't go through the effort to clarify it was combined to break it out into two lots unless they had intentions of doing something with it, conveying the land as a buildable lot. I, I don't see any other any other purpose for doing that. Um, I went through a similar experience in, in Exeter, but it was on a uh, almost 200 year old lot that the church had acquired and uh, the planning, the uh, uh, zoning administrator there said I had to go through a, uh, a subdivision plan to break it out, but I had a clearly described deed. I could find three of the four points, couldn't find the fourth point, but brought it to the zoning board and we overturned the administrator's decision. This is, in my opinion, this is something that was done in the 70s to, for the convenience of, of tax assessors and the like. And um, in, in my opinion, there are two lots there. They were subject to the rules and regulations at the time those lots were formed. So if they were buildable lots then, they're buildable lots now. Well, any any more discussion? I'll, I'll put my two cents in. Um, I'm looking at the sketch here, and it clearly meets the side setbacks. And if he wants a 30 by 45 house put on there, I don't understand why it's not a buildable lot. So I would say it's a buildable lot. Um, and I have no problem. It was clear, clear in, in 2005 that they determined that it was two separate lots. My, my parents had a had castle that I live on now that was um, described in separate castles that uh, Indeed, from the 60s. And so I've seen, and that went back to the early teens of 1917. And so I've seen that before. I've had, so I don't think there's any question about that. Not that that's the question involved here, but I, I, I feel that it's a buildable lot. Okay. What we wanted. Mr. Chairman, may, may I add something? Yes, please. Uh, we, in the letter from Diane Hardy, she suggested that as a condition of anything the board does that we provide a survey, we've already provided the survey and it, it is in that packet, okay? Um, and we, the, the diagram that was provided in the survey just shows uh, a hypothetical structure that could be built on the property and meet the setbacks. We're, we're not asking for a, a variance from any of those setbacks at all. Um, the, the decision from December of 05, I just would finally say, um, at least according to the minutes, and I was there at the meeting that night, I remember it, we were back in the days when we did this in person, and there was some <laughs> deliberation about this, and uh, the, the board found uh, that, that there were two lots. Uh, we didn't, uh, at the time, we didn't think much of, of, the, uh, of the decision, we just assumed buildable lots and it wasn't until just recently we found out that was an issue at all. But part of the decision was to let the tax 
to let the tax office know, let the assessor know that the, that the property should be separated and taxed uh, separately. Uh, <clears throat> and that, that was never done. Uh, so it's, it's been taxed as one lot. And so there was no follow up on this where there should have been. That happens from time to time. Yep. Um, well, if there's no further discussion on the board's part, I'll entertain a motion. Al? Um, I'm trying to get the... <clears throat> I'm administratively challenged here. I'm trying to find the, the proper... Um, you got to help me with it. All right. Can I suggest something, Mr. Absolutely, Diane. You know, what we're doing here is seeking a clarification. So basically just this is to confirm the intent of the application dating back to whatever May 2005 was to determine whether this was a buildable lot of record. And I think what I'm hearing from everyone is yes, that was what the intent was. So it's just a clarification. So keep it, I would just keep it simple. And I just wanted to also mention that right under current zoning, we're talking about a single family house, not a multifamily building. And I just want that to be clear. We had realtors calling saying, oh, can I put three or four units out there? I'm like, eh, no. So anyway, but the, the intent was that it would be approved for a single family home because that's what was allowed in that zone um, at the time. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah. You want gotta, me to say that? Gotta love these volunteer boards. I know it. The decision of what was the date? May 25th, was it? 2005 or May 2025, uh -huh. that the intent of the decision was to allow the conveyance of this separate lot, 5,000. Square foot lot for construction of a single family home. Make it so. And I think it was, Diane, I think it was December 12, 2005. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So we let, let, let's, let's have that stand as the motion. Uh, all those in favor, oh, excuse me. Uh, Wayne, are you in favor? Yes, I am. Steve? <clears throat> Excuse me, I vote aye. James, are you still with us? I saw you pop up. Al, are you in favor? I vote aye. Um, and I'll vote aye. And we'll show uh, James is temporarily absent. I think his sausage was burning or something. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I just make the comment. Ed, thanks so much. I think I think your your summary was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the whole intent was to make it a buildable lot, and it should have been clear in the first. Right. All right. Uh, Moving on, I lost my notes now. Oh well. All right. Good night. Thank you. There it is. All right, item three on the agenda, item C on the agenda. Application of Elliot and Donna Reed at one Oak Knoll Drive, Newmarket, New Hampshire, tax map U1, lot one dash. 23 R2 zone for special exception for an, ex <coughs> an accessory dwelling unit ADU from section 234 of the new market zoning ordinance. Hello. Hello. 
Uh, Donna or Elliot, you're. I'm, I'm Donna Reed, and we're getting. Well, we're having some echo problems here. Echo, echo. In the Grand Canyon, Bob, I, I can't. I can't hear that very well. They're taking care of it as we speak. And you're muted, Elliot. Yeah. You're okay. you're muted, Elliot. That's fine. Okay, I think we're all set now. Yep, go ahead, make your presentation. Oh, um, we're seeking permission to build an addition and you call an accessory dwelling on our house at one Oak Knoll. Um, uh, we would like, uh, we would move into the addition and um, our son who grew up in this house would move into the current dwelling with his um, two daughters, the young daughters and his wife. Okay. Uh, sometimes I tend to move a full set of plans and thought maps. And I hope everybody had a chance to look at them. It's pretty self explanatory, I think. There was some concern about parking on the property. Uh, the existing driveway. I don't know if I don't see this. Uh, yeah, we got we got the addition of the uh, the driveway layout. Okay, good. Then that's I thought that was pretty much taken care of. That. So. For uh, an accessory apartment, there are um, eight conditions. Yeah. Then the accessory apartment shall be a minimum of 300 square feet and a maximum of 1,000 square feet of finished living area. The accessory apartment shall be uh, either be an apartment without a separate bedroom or a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment. One of the dwelling units must be owner occupied. There shall be a minimum of two parking spaces for each dwelling unit. <coughs> a, parking, a parking space shall be defined as a rectangular space, nine feet by 18 feet. Parking spaces shall be permitted within the setbacks if the location is over 50 feet from an abutting dwelling unit. No exterior changes shall be made unless they maintain <clears throat> the aesthetic continuity of the accessory unit with the principal dwelling unit as a single family dwelling. <clears throat> Adequate water and sewer disposal shall be provided if town water and sewer service, the tie in fee shall be ma uh, made. <clears throat> Granting the special uh, exception would be consistent with <clears throat> section 32-51B. An interior door shall be provided between the principal dwelling unit and the accessory dwelling unit. However, it shall not be required to, main, to remain locked. Yeah, we have all, I believe we have all those conditions covered. Um, our, we have a new roof and fairly new siding, so it's going to be very easy to match up the exterior at the current um, house that we live in. It's um, and both, of course, um, are one story and it will be an L shape. The plans are very thorough. Um, okay, um, I'm going to open it up right now to uh, public comment. Is there anyone out there from the in a butter or from the public that would like to speak to this? I see our neighbor Lee. Hi, Lee. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Lee. I'm their backyard neighbor. And yeah. if you, Lee, I, if I, you, I can bring you over a set of plans if you want to look at the detail. I'd be happy to bring those over tomorrow. That, that would be great, actually. I will. I, mean, yeah. I, I don't have any objection as long as it meets all the setbacks. Um, it does. And, and it does, I assume. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. We had a lot surveyed. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that. Yes. Um, so you know, as long as we're 
following the rules, I, I don't think it should be a problem. Lee, I can actually text you the, everything you need to see. It's all a PDF file. If you go to the town's website, the zoning board website, on the agenda section, you can download all the documents that we're looking at. Oh, okay. On the website. Oh, really? Oh. They're but always I'll be kindly. I'll just bring you over a copy. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. And I see Paula Smart is on there as well. And Paula, um, I can bring something over to you if you'd like to look at it as well. Thank you, Donna. Um, I've actually seen the plans and- um, Oh, great. We don't think there's any objections to anything. And like Lee says, once, if everything's within its setbacks, there shouldn't be an issue. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. So where would I find that, that meeting? I'm in the website. Go down to the meeting today, today's address, and you've got to slide the bar all the way over because it's the the download section's a little hidden. Oh, <laughs> I'm a newbie, so. <laughs> I've had to fight it a few times too, so you're oh. in good company. I'll bring it to you tomorrow, Lee. Is it under, which you say it's under, not under minutes, it's under. Go, go to agenda. agenda. And that will bring up our online meeting. So upcoming meetings, I see a zoning board of adjustment. That's this meeting, right? Yeah, correct. I like that. That. And then uh, agendas. Oh, I see. That okay. Up the agenda. Yeah. Go, and then go, click go on the application of Elliot and Donna Reed. And that will bring up all the materials that were submitted. You've got to slide it further over to the right because the first one just gives you the agenda. The next one gives you all the downloads. So you got to slide the, you got to, you got to scroll all the way over to the right. I'm trying to do this on an iPad. So. <laughs> uh, I had problems with the first few times I did it too. It's I see easy. the agenda. Scroll it over just a little bit more. To the right. And it, it, there's a, it's a, it's a, these are all PDF documents. So, oh, all I see. Oh, oh. Did you click on the item on the agenda? Because it's interactive. You click on it, brings you to all the documentation. Oh, oh, there we go. Hey. Plot map. There you go. Oh, there it is. I see it. I have a question, Paula Smart speaking, 27 Riverbend Road. Um, on, on the original site plan, a second driveway, and my understanding is maybe that driveway is not going to be in there now? No, no, we, we were looking at different ways of having parking, and I decided the best way is to basically expand the original one to just in front of the house. I can show you that. It looks like your parking is going to be like off to the side of your existing um, yeah. existing driveway. Yeah, just make it wider, like a lot yeah. longer. So yeah, yeah. Like a car pool. Yeah. You you do realize that uh, you can't alter you you really can't alter your driveway cut itself. Once you get onto the parcel, you can do a little bit more, but uh, you got to go through public works if you're going to do anything to where it it ties into the roadway. You got to get a driveway permit. Right, uh, no, we, we'll would, yeah, we'll, we wouldn't we'll increase it. like where it goes across the culvert, just when you come in, then it would widen out mm -hmm. past the culvert. Yeah, Does that make affect, sense? Yeah, we wouldn't affect the road frontage at all. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Uh, is there anyone else out there that would like to comment on this? That being said, I'm going to close the public, uh, public comment section and open up for discussion amongst the board members. <clears throat> uh, so Bob, I lost it for about five to seven minutes. I thought it was bad internet connection. I had to restart my computer. So I'm going to, uh, unless there was something big that uh, I missed, I'm gonna stay quiet for a minute or so. Okay. <clears throat> well, I think the plans are pretty self-explanatory. <clears throat> okay. So there wasn't any further uh, big stuff that I missed. With which one? Uh, this 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 one we're talking about right now. No. 
Okay, that, perfect. That wasn't in, nothing that wasn't in the in the written record. Excellent. Thank you. It's pretty cut and dry, Bob. The uh, and now maybe is a good time to remind people on this call and and outside of this call if they're viewing elsewhere <clears throat> that at special exceptions, if the conditions are met, the law is clear. Uh, the board has to grant that we have very little discretion. The board has to grant um, the application for the special exception that's codified in New Hampshire case law at Shell Oil versus Manchester at 101 New Hampshire, page 76. A decision that uh, known to at least members of this board. So, you know, I, I, I'm willing to listen to discussion from others, but um, there isn't any. Uh, willing to make a motion to approve um, the application and grant the special exception for an accessory dwelling unit uh, from section 234 of the new market zoning ordinance. I second that. Okay, we have a motion and second from Steve and, and second by Wayne. Um, that being said, uh, let's take a roll call vote. Wayne? Aye. Uh, Steve? Aye. James? Aye. Al? I see you nodding your head yes, okay. Uh, and I'll vote yes. So you have it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you all so very much for taking time out of your life to help us. Good to see you, Lee. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Don't wave, wave sometime. <laughs> You know, we've been isolated so long. It's been a long time since we served on the water board together. Oh my goodness, that is a long time. Oh my gosh. Of course, I'm looking at Trina's name. And oh my goodness. Well, my wife's I have, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, with that being said, the next order of business is to minutes from the last meeting. So do you need that anymore? No. We're all set. Okay, good. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies. All right. All right. I'm just going to find it. Bye, Lee. Bye, Elliot. <laughs> and Donna. Recognize him. I had him. Recognize the name. All right. Uh, has everybody had a chance to read the minutes? Yes. Any comments? I believe oh, there. Okay. I didn't know where it was. I can't seem to find mine. I thought I had them. Well, I moved to approve the minutes of January 11, 2021. Second. All right. Uh, I have a motion to approve the minutes. Um, we've got to take a roll call vote. Wayne? Aye. James? Well, I was going to say, do we need a second or no? We, yes. did, we did get one, didn't we? Yes, yes, for me. Oh, sorry. I missed that. James? Yes, aye. Al? Aye. Steve? Yep, I vote the aye. Aye. Unanimous ayes. Very good. I think we're we're good to go on that. Uh, Wayne, did you want to get into the breezeway discussion? What? <laughs> what? Did you want to get into the breezeway discussion? The breezeway. Let, let's let's adjourn. Oh, you've left us with great mystery. Our our first our first oh, our yeah. first hearing. Oh. oh. <laughs> yes. I'll make yeah. a move to adjourn so we can continue. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 James? Aye. Yeah. Wayne? Aye. Aye. Very good. So that's done. Uh, until next time, Diane, we're here. Okay. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Great.